Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the House Human Services meeting for Thursday, July 21st. This morning, we are going to be taking up the COVID-19 response uh, for child care for children and families and the supports and services and programs that support them and continue to do so through our pandemic. And just wanna welcome everyone here. And um, I, I have to first say, um, Amy Schoenberg, you have the best picture up that I've seen in a long time. I, I, it's hard not to comment on it, so. <laughs> Thank you, I couldn't resist. It's just for this week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good, it's, it's good. Uh, so uh, welcome and uh, Commissioner Brown, uh, welcome to our committee once again. I think you'll be spending a bit of time here, it seems like this session and um, committee members and uh, other folks the commissioner needs to um, move along to appropriations after our committee. So I'm gonna ask if we could just let him get through his presentation and then um, uh, save our questions till when he is completed. So the floor is all yours, Commissioner Brown. Uh, uh, good morning and, and, and thank you, Representative Wood. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, we were asked to come in and, and um, report out on the status of the of the child care system, and there were some questions um, asked in, in the invitation. And so we've tried to uh, answer those questions in our presentation today. And so we'll walk you through um, our presentation. Happy to answer any questions um, that you have. Um, I believe you have the, do you have the PowerPoint, Julie, that you can put up and, and share on the screen so we can walk through it? Uh, yes, one moment. Mm -hmm. And committee members, you can also find that on the committee page. Sorry, it's going to take me a moment. And then uh, while we're waiting, I'll just introduce the team um, that we have here with us today. We, um, with me, um, we have Sarah Truckel, our Chief Financial Officer. Um, also, uh, Melissa Regal Garrett from the uh, Child Development Division, the leadership team there. And then also, um, we have Miranda Gray. Um, who we've borrowed um, from the Economic Services Division, um, where she's the Deputy Director of the Reach Up Program. We um, brought her over to work on the Hubs Project um, last fall, and so she'll be here to kind of um, answer any questions and present um, the data we have on the Hub system in response to the questions from the committee. Um, so if you want to um, jump to page two, Julie, um, please. Uh, so one of the uh, questions from the committee is what's been the impact um, on the child care system um, with the pandemic? Um, overall, as you will see um, uh, from, from the data on the chart we provided here, um, overall, the, the impact has been about a 1% drop in the number of slots. If you look, we've lost about um, 319 slots statewide um, since the pandem pandemic began. Um, in, two in December of 19, we had just over 32,000 slots. That would be uh, either licensed providers or registered home providers. Um, and then at the end of uh, December of 20, we had uh, 31,700. Um, I think the story on this chart would be that the impact has really uh, varied across the state. I think uh, the pandemic has had an impact in certain areas of the state. If you look at Newport, um, Newport uh, has taken a pretty big hit overall. They've lost uh, uh, over 15% of, of their slots overall uh, um, from in that year's time. Uh, Middlebury lost almost 6% area. Um, the Montpelier area has lost almost 4%, um, and Rutland approximately 3.5%. And so I think, you know, while other states have gained a little bit or, or a very minimal loss, overall four di districts in, in the state uh, communities have been hit uh, disproportionately, and those would be the ones I just re reviewed. Um, and the other thing I would caution um, is that um, you know, we're still in the midst of the pandemic and, you know, and so there could be impacts still to come that we, we just can't foresee at this time. Although, as you'll see later in the presentation, um, you know, we have certainly uh, 
done a lot as a state to prop up and support the child care system. Um, Julie, if you could move on um, to number three, and then just you know, looking at over the number of slots, this is just a look at um, how many child care programs have closed. So you know, so some programs could have reduced, you know, in, in reducing slots but stayed open. Um, this looks at a historical trend um, of uh, programs that have closed. Um, you know, uh, you know, every year we do see programs open up and programs close. You know, we saw a large number of closures in the 2016. Um, you know, uh, over the last couple of years, we we saw a decline in the number of programs closing. Um, um, so, you know, our you know, we're not seeing an uptick in closures due to the pandemic. I think what we're seeing is just more of a, of the historical trend for the last couple of years, where you know some programs open up and some programs close. Um, Melissa, I didn't know if you wanted to add in anything here from your perspective. Oh, must be she's not been able to jump on yet. Um, and if you look at what one we've, um, you know, looked at the programs that have closed um, you know, over the last year, some of them in, in about 16% indicated it was due to uh, low enrollment. Um, and then also some impacts of, um, and 12%, it was due to some impacts due to the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we do have had, you know, in working with our providers, we know some of our providers um, fall into the, what we would consider a vulnerable category in terms of um, age or underlying health conditions that make um, you, you know, um, working um, in a childcare setting, uh, you know, risky for some of them and some chose to close as a result of that is what we have heard as well. And then moving on um, to, the, to the next slide, um, the impact of the pandemic, um, what is utilization looking like? Um, right now, um, uh, utilization is at about 78% if you look at the chart. Um, uh, compared to other years. So utilization is down. What we're seeing um, is that there are, uh, you, you know, families are, many families are now working remotely and teleworking from home. And I think many have chosen um, to have their children stay home with them and not access childcare. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're currently at 70, as I indicated, 78% of what we saw in, in state fiscal year 20. And we're at 75% of what we would have had for utilization in, in state fiscal year 2019. Um, and what, what you will see in that um, under utilization, um, as we testified in our BAA the other day, you know, we do have a, you know, there was a 4.8 million down in our subsidy line item in the Budget Adjustment Act as a result of, of this under utilization um, across the state right now. And then Julie, if you could move to the next slide. Um, uh, you know, this slide highlights uh, the investments the state made um, uh, in response to the pandemic to stabilize um, and preserve uh, the childcare system. Um, you know, we started in early March um, with the childcare um, business stabilization funding program um, that, that ran from mid-March through, through the end of May. Um, where we allocated out uh, approximately $8.4 million um, through the stabilization program to, for child care providers. Um, also through mid-March through the end of May, um, there was an essential person child care um, and incentive payment program. Um, that, that was almost $5.7 million um, invested in the child care system. Um, and then in the summer, um, we um, did a restart program, uh, restart stipends to support programs reopening and, and, um, and complying with the health and safety uh, regulations to, to reopen. Um, that was about $6.6 .6 million invested. And then um, late um, in the summer and into the fall, um, there was the organizational or operational relief grant program where uh, $11.2 million um, was provided um, to our, our, our daycare system. There was also other money that was allocated that went to the 
uh, CIS providers, Children's Integrated Services providers, and the parent child centers. This total is just uh, the money that went to the child care providers. And there was a lot more flexibility um, in terms of uh, what providers asked and, and needed in the operational organizational relief grant program. Um, you know, they could have used it for, um, uh, uh, you know, building improvements, um, staff salaries, supplies. I mean, there was a lot more, there was more flexibility. It wasn't as targeted as some of those other programs. So I think it was very well received. Um, and we're hoping as we'll talk more in the opportunities, we are in line to get some more federal stimulus money for the child care system. And our hope is, is that it, it, it could be used in that flexible manner as well to support our providers. And then, um, you know, we allocated approximately and spent $3.8 million um, uh, for the hub system. And then also uh, for tuition for families who, who qualified uh, for CCFAP uh, uh, payments uh, for their children in those hubs. Um, and then also we had providers uh, take part in the uh, financial the Department of Financial Regulations hazard pay program. It was about 750,000 allocated out to providers which covered the period from March through June 1st. Um, and then also this fall, um, we uh, implemented the child care workforce stabilization payment that what really looked at uh, covering and stabilizing the workforce uh, in, the fall, in the fall time period, not looking back, but for the current time period. And there was almost $4 million allocated out to providers and their staff in that program as well. Um, uh, so all told, um, we, we in the last 10 months have, have provided approximately $40.5 million to child care providers uh, uh, to support them in response to the pandemic. I don't know if there was any questions. I can pause for, for a moment. Are there any questions uh, on, on this slide or I guess any of the previous ones since now you've opened yourself up, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have I have a, a question. Um, the have you what have you noticed in terms of um, barriers, or have you noticed any particular barriers uh, in terms of the uh, two things, uh, both the reduction in the number of registered homes as as well as the um, reduced. Um, utilization. I mean, is it, do, do you point to anything besides the fact that they're, uh, you know, we're obviously dealing with a pandemic, like um, shortage of workforce, for instance, uh, was one of the things that I was wondering about. Sure. And I, and I believe Melissa has been able to, to finally uh, jump on uh, the, the, the hearing. And so I'll, I'll, def, I'll uh, have Melissa jump in here and, and speak to what they're, they're hearing from providers and seeing on the ground. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Good morning, everyone. For the record, I'm Melissa Regal Garrett. I'm the policy director for the Child Development Division. Um, so we've actually been tracking child care closures for years, and we publish a report each January um, on the child care uh, closure and uh, capacity uh, for the system. And we, uh, as we look at, are looking at those numbers and preparing that report for this year, what we're really seeing is similar trends to what we've seen in prior years uh, and similar reasons uh, for closing. Um, in fact, we saw probably about a fifth of our closures over the course of the year occurred prior to the onset of the COVID crisis um, and closing the system down. Um, so we have seen some impact of the COVID crisis on closures, um, but it's not as significant as we thought uh, we were going to see buy it and we do in fact credit the um, money that was infused into the system uh, with really stabilizing it um, and keeping that system going. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I guess a follow-up question is, um, since you have looked at that data over time, do you see a difference in those um, registered, uh, do you see a difference in the proportion of registered homes versus um, other licensed centers. Uh, so are there more, is it a higher percentage of the closures that are in registered homes this year? 
Um, so we've been trending for years with more registered homes uh, closing than uh, licensed programs closing. Um, and what we saw this year was the trend line for registered homes remain steady. So, um, yes, uh, there were closures in registered homes at a higher rate than there were in licensed programs. But the trend line uh, remains steady this year um, from what we've seen in prior years. Uh, we did have an increase. Uh, in uh, the licensed centers closing this year uh, that then after school programs as well that surprised us a little bit. Uh, and we are digging deeper into that so that when we're able to publish that report, uh, we can really, uh, you know, look into that and tell that story behind that data and whether COVID uh, impacted that or not. Okay, thank you. And, and we most likely will invite you all back to discuss that report when, when we get it. So Representative McFawn. Thank you. Um, I, I've, I'm a, a great supporter of uh, child care. And um, what I saw in this, these uh, slides has got me worried. Um, we put $40 million in and more to come. And um, maybe I'll ask the question this way. What's the prediction in terms of the future of uh, centers, uh, places where these kids can go, uh, reopening or more utilization. When we're talking about 80% of the closures uh, were from COVID, that I'm just one, it, it's almost like the school system. You know, there's less kids and we'll put more money into it. And now I'm worried that we're doing the same thing here. Um, you know, that's a great, great question and concern. Um, you know, the childcare system is a market-based system, a little different than schools. Um, and yeah. what we saw as the economy shut down um, completely in, in March and April and into May, uh, you know, that really could have, significantly crippled the child care system, which is critical, you know, for, for working families and right. families have a, have a support system for their children. Um, as, as, you know, we stabilized and reopened, um, you know, we still are, are working for, for those that are able to work remotely um, and, and are, are choosing to do so. And because of the way schools have, have opened up and, are, and, are, are, and some are fully remote, Many are a hybrid model, and some are open full times. It's it's really made, um, you know, predicting what the long term prognosis is for the childcare system. I think the goal was is to preserve it and stabilize it, get through the pandemic, and then understand how how the pandemic might, you know, um, change. Our work, the way we work and live in the future, and is and are there going to be long-term um, ramifications for the childcare system where there needs to be, um, you know, given it's a market-based system, are there going to be corrections that are long-term, or is it going to bounce back? And I think, given we're still in the pandemic, it's too early to say, you know, what it's going to look like long-term. And I would, and I wouldn't look at at compare it, um, to, you know, to you know the school funding system and the cost per pupil with, you know, certainly the demographics are not in Vermont's favor right now. And, and you know, similar how, how it impacts the school system, but the infusion of, of, um, of dollars into the childcare system were for a very specific purpose to stabilize and preserve the system. So when we came out of the pandemic, the economy could thrive and parents had the opportunity to re-engage with, with the childcare system. We didn't want to see mass closures of, of, of child care businesses, just given the impact it could have on the economy. You know, you know, just like in other areas of the economy, you know, like there's all real concern. Many of these businesses aren't going to be able that, are, you know, non child care businesses like the entertainment industry, restaurants are going to really not survive. And that can really have a long term impact on the overall economy. We could have seen the same thing like, you know, uh, the child care system is, 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 you know, the foundation of our, in, in many ways, of our economy and supporting parents and, the, uh, and that whole system, economic system we have. 
And so it was really important that we preserve it um, so that we could, you know, have it available and then, and then determine what those long-term implications are for the system once we're through the pandemic. So what I hear you say, Commissioner, is it's it's too soon to tell right now. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, Representative Whitman. And my apologies um, to Representative Whitman and Representative Small. Um, I realize that you haven't uh, seen some of the people in this um, in this uh, committee, virtual committee room. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to introduce yourselves, uh, Representative Whitman, then Representative Small. Of course. Um, Hello, everybody, and thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Dane Whitman, representing Bennington District uh, 2 1. Um, and my question was for, uh, or I'll let Taylor introduce herself as well. Uh, thank you, Representative Whitman. And hi, everyone. My name is Representative Taylor Small, representing Winooski and a sliver of Burlington. Great. And for the rest of the witnesses, all the rest of us are the same ones you saw the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Representative Whitman. Thank you. Um, my question's for Commissioner Brown. Um, looking at these programs, um, it looks like some of them were specific to closures, um, like the full closure that we saw in March. Um, assuming that, um, God forbid, we don't have another full closure that we're able to kind of keep the pandemic under control, which of these programs could you see continuing um, into, um, 2021, and which of these closures would you consider, or which of these programs, sorry, would you consider more sort of one-time costs that we won't that we won't see again? Um, I, you know, we as as I indicated earlier, um, you know, the state's been allocated. We believe we're waiting for the award letter from the federal government. Um, we believe around 12.5 to 12.8 million dollars. To, to further stabilize the child care system. I think, and it is targeted to the child care system. Um, you know, I think all of these separate programs that we ran really met a specific purpose at the time. I think the one program that I think moving forward would, would continue to benefit the providers and give them greater flexibility in terms of meeting what their specific need is as a provider would be the uh, relief grant program. You know, there was a lot of flexibility built into that program based on, you know, to meet the needs of that specific provider. And so that it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't targeted to one specific aspect of the child care system. Providers had a much more flex flexibility in terms of they had a structural building need they needed to meet or, or a systems like a HVAC system. You know, there was a lot of different things um, expanding their playground, you know, their play area, outside play area for kids to make it more safe because they were going to spend a lot more time out there and upgrading it. Um, so there was just a lot more creativity and flexibility um, that that providers had. And, and I think moving forward, that would be how we would like to target additional funds, just so that it, it, it allows providers to meet their specific needs. And I think we're going to start the conversation with our with our partners um, in this area about how we can um, you know, roll out those new dollars just to make sure we are meeting the needs of providers. But I would say based on our experience, it's the relief grant program that would have a lot of value continuing with these new dollars that are being infused into the system that are coming our way from the federal government. Uh, you know, and just as the, the, you know, the Biden administration indicated before they took office that they're proposing another round of stimulus in the near future and, and my, from just reading up on, on a high level, there could be even more resources coming to the state for our, our child care system. And so we'll have to wait and see what, what that looks like when it happens, but we do know we're in line for about 12 and a half to $12.8 million. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And just a quick follow-up. Um, could you tell, talk a little bit more about the child care workforce stabilization? I saw that that was going up until fall um, 2020. Yeah, um, you know, one of the one of the areas um, of concern when we were standing up the hub system, you know, for, for schools that were that were going to be remote and were, had a place for kids to go during the day, um, you know, we were, you know, the child care system uh, staffing levels are challenged even in the best of times. So, you know, recruiting and retaining staff, 
and by expanding a, a new area of program, which it was the hub system, you know, we were really concerned that we didn't want to, um, uh, you know, uh, start taking staff from the childcare system and having them go into the hub system because we were, you know, um, you know, providing startup money to the hubs, which infused cash and 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 some incentives for for to, for recruitment to bring staff into the hub system. And so one of the objectives was just to make sure that we were stabilizing and make and making sure that that staff weren't moving between the the regular the childcare system and then this new hub system, which was really meant to be a temporary uh, solution uh, during the pandemic. And and we don't envision that at this time being a long-term solution in Vermont. Um, and then also just recognizing um, that, you know, our childcare providers have really stepped up during the pandemic and, and the providers and their staff, you know, um, there's a lot of risk involved, uh, you, know, uh, you know, with the spread of the virus and, you know, and, and as you'll see many providers um, weathered through it and stayed open. Um, they were deemed essential early on and so I think the stabilization program as a way to recognize um, their commitment and sacrifice, to, you know, that, that they made uh, to Vermont and Vermonters to, to, you know, continue to stay open and provide, um, you know, critical care to children as essential workers and others continue to, you know, to be able to work. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, I have uh, one question in regards to, you know, essentially all of these COVID allocations are one time, one time dollars, you know, through relief packages and, and the, the 12 and a half million coming our way is also one time dollars, although we, we have heard the incoming administration speak to the um, intent, at least, of trying to shore up child care across the country. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, as, as we look to the state funding that is in childcare, and, and we know that there is gonna be some sort of change in the workforce habits after uh, post COVID, uh, because there's, there's just been, uh, you know, the ability of people to, to figure out how to work from home. And we, we don't know how much is, is going to return to our, our host um, programs. So I guess one of the things that I'm, um, urging, if this is more of a statement than a question, one of the things that I'm urging is that uh, the state not be too quick to um, adjust in a downward fashion, otherwise known as reducing, the mm -hmm. base funding for child care programs, you know, going forward. Um, you know, I know we've seen uh, in about close to $5 million in uh, the budget adjustment um, for this year, and, uh, and I know, I know that uh, as a state, we're committed to childcare. I'm just, um, you know, some of those funds could be used to increase, increase um, payments made to programs to further enhance um, qualifications of staff and things like that. So it's, it's just, uh, we're all in this together, trying to figure it out uh, and, you know, trying to sort of hold the reins as close as we can uh, until we get through this. Um, so it's just a little, I know you're thinking about this going forward. Absolutely, point well taken, and you know we would agree that you, you know it, it it's this is not the time to 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 you know think that what has happened in the pandemic is a long term trend or 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 or, or correction in, in the in the system. I think you know we need to be very measured in how we approach this and and really let you know data and in the system stabilize once we come out of the pandemic to understand you, you know how the pandemic has changed our lives and the way we work and, and how we adjust our, our, our different systems of care to that um, and that needs to be very thoughtful and, and, and methodical on how we approach that I would agree. Thank you so I think um, what we'll have you do is just to continue through recognizing that uh, we have limited time with you so um, thank you. Sure. Um, and then moving on um, to the next slide, there was um, some questions regarding um, the hubs and I'll let uh, Miranda um, kind of walk you through the hub grant program and, and we're, where we're at with it right now. Good morning. For the record, my name is Miranda Gray. I'm the TANF Deputy Director for the Economic Services Division. 
This fall, I was temporarily reassigned to be the project manager for the School Age Hubs. I'd like to begin by saying that the School Age Hub project was a success because of strong collaboration and teamwork. Vermont After School was a dedicated and thoughtful partner that hit the ground running when we engaged them in conversations in mid-August about setting up hubs. Let's Grow Kids, the Agency of Natural Resources, the Division of Fire Safety, the Agency of Education, our licensing division within the Child Development Division, and the Department of Health, as well as many community members, made establishing hubs their priority. It was because of this teamwork that we were able to establish 43 hubs. I will now pivot to our data. The first point of clarification I would like to make is that we reported previously and in testimony last week, you heard from Vermont After School that we had 44 hubs. However, only 43 hubs actually serve children. One hub in the Rutland area notified me in early November that they were no longer going to move forward with standing up a hub. Last week, you also heard that we had 102 sites, which at one point we did. However, not all site ends, sites ended up opening for various reasons. Some of those reasons included the site ended up not being a good fit for school-aged children, or the hub was unable to recruit enough staff to open additional sites. The number of sites, 43, is also smaller than we thought we might be needed, but that is due to how schools chose to reopen. No hubs were established in areas of the state where children were in-person learning five days a week or where children were in-person for some portion of their day. As of last week, we had 82 locations actively serving children. However, I will mention that this is a moving number. As schools bring children back to in-person learning, there's less of a need or no need for a hub. Of these 82 sites, 66 of these sites are regulated programs. 16 are unregulated or exempt programs, which were approved to continue to operate beyond December. Originally, the um, grants were just to go through um, children's winter break. And these unregulated exempt sites have the ability to serve approximately 300 children. 11 of the 93 sites um, have closed now, and eight of, these sites, eight of these sites were exempt sites who requested to close or no, because there was no longer a need to operate. The hub grant got funds to programs to support them in making adjustments to serve school-aged children. Many sites were existing regulated programs with available capacity because infants, toddlers, and preschoolers were not attending. This led The legislative change allowed existing providers to serve school-aged children full day on remote learning days, which resulted in children and families having the ability to experience continuity of care. This committee wanted to know about the ability for programs to continue operating, and we feel because 66 of the sites are regulated programs, they will be able to cont continue to operate and serve school-aged children as needed. I will now turn the testimony back to Commissioner Brown. Thank you. And we'll open it up to any questions uh, regarding the HUB program and where we're at with that. Um, thank you. Um, Miranda, um, so I thought that we heard in testimony that funding for the hubs ended in December. Um, so um, is that accurate or, is, or do I have a misunderstanding? No, that is accurate, um, Madam Vice Chair. And the hub grants so, were uh, um, to start, they were for startup costs, um, the first month of operating costs. So um, if hubs chose to, if they had the ability to remain open, they, um, they could but the funding we gave them was just for that first month. And so um, are, how are they being funded? Through CCFAP, uh, education? How, how are they continuing to be funded? After school dollars? It's a combination of all of the above that you've mentioned, and uh, as well as private pay. Um, we have families that do not qualify for CCFAP, um, so they are private paying these providers. Um, but I do believe providers have also from reports from them that I have received, also tried to access um, other funding opportunities as they could, you know, community grants, if you will. Okay. Are there questions from committee members? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands go up, so um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ju Julie, if you could, um, move to the next slide, uh, you know, uh, Vermont, just to uh, highlight, Vermont was recognized nationally and we've uh, included some links to different articles and in, in news outlets that, you know, kind of touched on Vermont and on the programs and the success of our programs. Um, and so just so people wanted to check them out, but we were nationally recognized 
um, as a model of, of uh, states responding to the pandemic and supporting its childcare system. So I think we should all be proud of, of the work we've done um, across the board. Uh, everyone played a significant role on the providers, uh, our community partners like Let's Grow Kids, Vermont After School, the legislature, um, you know, and allocating the funds out, our, our teams here at DCF, um, really strategizing and, you know, uh, how to implement these programs and then implementing them. Uh, there's certainly some bumps in the road along the way for sure. Um, but I, I think overall, we should all be proud of, of the work we've done. Um, but we also recognize that we're still in it and we still have a ways to go and we'll still dedicate the same, um, you know, uh, you know, drive to making sure we continue to support our providers and, and, our, and our families and kids in the state um, through the rest of the pandemic and hopefully as we begin to reopen as well. And then um, on the next slide, um, you know, we were asked to kind of uh, touch on uh, lessons learned. Um, and, it, you know, if there's anything we could glean from our work in this and, you know, if we could go back and do it again, um, you know, how, are there things we would do differently or, or what or what really worked? Um, um, uh, you know, and so what I, I would say is, as you know, we do have an opportunity with this new money that's coming in that I mentioned in the stimulus, um, the, the 12 million. Um, uh, you know, as I indicated before, the operational relief grant, I think, was a, was a, a real success because um, it, warded, it awarded funds out in a lump sum manner and, and, you know, based on the request of the provider for them to, to meet the specific need they had. It wasn't like uh, money targeted to everyone for the same purpose. It really had some flexibility. Um, and so I think, you know, that's how we would recommend structuring um, future programs when funding's available, particularly for this next 12 and a half million, really allowing the provider some, some flexibility, um, you know, to meet their fixed cost and any increased operating expenses that they had, you know, certainly um, complying with the new health and safety regulations to continue to operate as a, a, a day, as a child care provider. Um, you know, there really were um, expenses and technical expertise needed to can, can, continue to stay open. And so, you know, funding is critical and resources are critical to, to meet those needs. Um, also, it provided um, the ability to backfill a loss of revenue so that they continued um, and were able to sustain as an as a actual business um, due to decreased enrollment, as, as we've talked about. You know, we're at um, like 78% of a capacity from the year before. Um, you know, that impacts their bottom line as a business. And so it's important that we make sure that they stay viable. Um, and then also, you know, uh, um, and, you know, we've seen sporadic, you know, throughout the pandemic, you, you know, we have seen um, the virus appear um, in, in childcare centers. And so in response, some of them, you know, you have to close temporarily um, and increase your infection control measures. And, and so, you know, there's an impact there in terms of having to shut down and, and a complete loss of revenue. And so there's flexibility in, in allowing the funds to be used that way. And then also, um, you know, and this is, was an issue before the pandemic, but I, I think it's just been incredibly magnified um, is, you know, there's expense in recruiting and retaining and, and supporting your staff um, in, in this work. And so allowing flexibility of the funds in, in that area, um, as we did, um, I think it just provides the flexibility for childcare providers and centers um, to really utilize the funds to meet their unique situation at that time. And that would be our recommendation moving forward as we target additional relief that we do in a way that provides that flexibility to providers because each provider is different in what they need and what they're experiencing at any one time. Commissioner, would you would you anticipate using some of this learning that you've had over the course of the last um, 10 and a half months, uh, not only in pandemic relief coming, but in how the program is further um, redesigned as we go through the process after the pandemic? Yeah, I think once we're through the pandemic and we have and and you know and we're not operating at 100% every day, you know, many hours of the day, I mean, in response to the pandemic, our team, you know, across the board, our providers and our teams at DCF and our partners, 
you know, everyone's been working incredibly hard. And I think um, once we have the ability to kind of look back and reflect and really dig in and analyze what occurred, I think there are going to be lessons learned in, um, in, uh, and experiences that we can draw from, I think, to improve our system moving forward uh, uh, just in normal operations. I can't pinpoint what those are today, but mm -hmm. we have, but you know, given our experiences, um, there are things that I think we can capitalize on um, and leverage uh, once we return back to normal, whatever that looks like. And when okay, it looks nice. Like I see Representative Brumstead has a question. You're muted, Representative Brumstead. Okay, okay. <laughs> it said that I was on muted. Um, thank you. I, Commissioner Brown, I'm curious, I guess I have a couple of questions. One, on number one and two sort of go together. Um, are you thinking that centers would apply for these funds based on the, um, the bullets underneath, you know, that they would they would sort of need to justify what they want to use the funds for? Or are you thinking as one sort of says is that you would distribute them just based on how much you have divided and everyone would get a little more, a chunk of money to use in a way that makes sense to them? How we structured the, the original uh, uh, relief grant program is, is that providers did need to apply and identify um, the areas uh, where they were experiencing a loss or, or had additional expenses or needs like uh, building a new, a, a new play facility outside for kids or maybe a new gazebo where they could have kids come in and, and do temperature checks in the morning. I mean, there was a lot, a, a wide variety of things. I think that model worked. So we understood what, you know, it helps us collect data what providers are experiencing. And so we understand that and we get visibility into that. Um, and then it also allows us to capture the total need that's out there because when we were um, operating this program and trying to allocate out the money, we did learn some lessons immediately, like the need was greater than the funds. And so we were able to go back to the Joint Fiscal Committee through, you know, through that process and get additional funds you know, uh, in, in to do some of these programs so that we could meet most of the need or all of the needs in certain areas. And so I think that model works just because it, it does increase our data collection and visibility into what uh, providers are experiencing versus if we just allocated and divvied the money up. Because if you d dive down into, you know, who received what, it, there was a, there, while we have averages, there was a, a huge swing of, of who needed what and for what purpose. And I think we'd want to retain that flexibility. Okay, I just thinking of your own staff time, that <laughs> makes it a little bit harder because you got to go through everything and people might race to get the money before it runs out. Um, uh, I, I will say that um, we reallocated a lot of, of, of uh, project staff and, pro and program staff from other areas of the department to create a team to kind of work through and, 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 and stay in touch with providers and if we had questions regarding their submission. And so it was an incredible DCF team effort. We really did utilize staff from many different departments and divisions uh, or divisions and offices within DCF on some of, on some of these relief grant programs because it, they, it was a massive effort and we just in CDD um, just needed that extra you know, boost in, in resources to really get the work done and we're prepared to reallocate and 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 because those those staff are now experienced in this area and really learn from from the experience as well. And so I think we're well situated to continue to meet the needs through, through this type of program. That's great. And I agree, you guys did do a fantastic job and we heard that from centers. Um, I also wondered if you had considered putting in your recommendations, maybe a number three, which would say to have a better, um, well done, I'm not even sure of all the right words, but IT system, an updated, upgraded, <laughs> better system would be A in my question, and then B would be, have you spent any time thinking about what it would cost. I know that there's been lots of numbers floated out there about what it would cost for that, but have you thought about that at all? 
Yes, we think about it every day, just in terms of the normal operation of, 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 of uh, the, the child care uh, program and CDD. Um, as you know, our IT system is, is quite dated. Um, it's quite rickety and unstable. Um, just on a, on a somewhat regular basis, you know, the, uh, the subsidy payment system um, has a hiccup and we have to devote um, significant staff resources to manually enter, you know, the, the, you know, to pay providers. And so that happens every couple months. Um, the reason it's not here is because that was an underlying concern before the pandemic. And, you know, I'm happy to report that we are moving forward on the first module of the new building of uh, Bright Futures Information System known as BFIST. Um, you know, and we do have those analysis of, of what it would cost to build out the remainder of, of that system. That work has been done and we're happy to share it. it um, I think it's around 4.8 to $5 million as much as just speaking from memory. Um, Sarah Truckle, if you're on, would you wanna jump in here? I think you probably know those numbers a little better than I do. Yeah, so the level of effort that we submitted um, in our report, I believe last year, uh, put the price of the program at, I believe it was 6.7 million. Uh, the original estimate for the first module, which we're going to actually provide an update on further in this PowerPoint, is uh, $2.2 million, leaving us with a $4.5 million um, gap from the original level of effort. It should be noticed that um, as we're approaching a modular system, we're no longer doing a complete build at the same time. So um, what the original estimate was based on doing the entire system at once, and that might pivot slightly as we go through a module approach. That's terrific. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. Okay, let's um, continue moving along. Um, and then moving on um, uh, to the next slide, um, I think um, you know I think we've touched on on um, okay I think I missed the slide in my thing here. Hold on, I apologize. There we go. Um, uh, just some further highlights. Uh, you know, as I indicated before, you know, the child care system uh, really stepped up and, and responded to meet the needs of Vermonters. I think I, I can't um, speak enough of our providers and how they really did step up and our partners, uh, you know, who provided assistance and support as well. Um, you know, across the board, this, you know, the system just um, responded in a way that it, it was just phenomenal. Um, I you know, and as I indicated, we should all be proud of that. Uh, you know, I think also in, um, in terms of responding to the pandemic and the health and safety needs and responding, um, um, you know, and trying to stand up the hub system very quickly um, this fall, um, I think it really strengthened and broke down some uh, relationships and broke down some silos. Um, within state government and outside of state government in terms of our work with, you know, with uh, Department of Environmental Conservation regarding permitting, um, agency of education, our licensing unit, as Miranda indicated, it, it really was this incredible uh, team effort across the board to really respond quickly um, to, to, to the demands of the pandemic and, and to get results as, as quickly as we did. I think those are the lessons we would re, we really want to draw from um, at, when we return to normal. Is we don't want to go back in, in, into that old environment where where we were bifurcated and siloed, and and communication didn't always occur as as often and as quickly as we would want. I think we want to continue to leverage those relationships and processes that that we established in response to the pandemic. Um, so I, I think that's something I'd want to highlight and one of those things that moving forward, we really want to capitalize on um, no matter what happens. So. Um, the other thing I would say um, is that, you know, we've had teams working, um, you know, across the board in response to, um, you know, our, our, our child care solutions based team, um, you know, that really focused on recovery strategies. Um, you know, that, that really led to a lot of these programs and, and services that were, were provided. Um, 
you know, and then I think we also want to, uh, you know, kind of to, to your representative, uh, Madam Vice Chair, you know, those lessons learned moving forward and how can we, um, while we responded well, um, it wasn't without its hookups and how can we be better prepared for further um, events, you know, emergency or pandemic events or whatever those, you know, um, catastrophes could be, we want to be better prepared and, and leverage the lessons learned and those relationships we built and processes we built so that we are in a better position to respond in the future if something happens. I think that, you know, that that's the work that needs to happen as well. Um, and then Sarah, I'll have you touch on the, on the, on the next bullet here in, in the highlights, Sarah Truckle. I'm happy to do so. So the latest round of federal funding not only provided additional dollars to CCDF in the, uh, which we expect to be 12.5 to 12.8 million dollars for Vermont's allocation, but also had a slight increase in the CCDF base. Um, so I think what it highlights is just a continued investment from the federal government with regards to uh, childcare. And um, we've seen several more minimal, but increases in that funding, which ultimately means that we receive slightly more money every year, which is great. And so what, for what the, would be Vermont's share of that 85 million? We don't know. I can tell you that the FY20 federal budget, the share is 600 and I believe $60,000. And that's the money that's being used for FY20 and FY21 to support the first module of the BFIS system. So we're using last federal fiscal year 20 and federal fiscal year 21's increase to fund the first module of BFIS in addition to the remaining one-time funds, which the legislature appropriated several sessions ago um, of a million dollars of which 100,000 was used for planning and $900,000 will be used for development. Represent Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Sarah, can you define BFIS for me? Sure, BFIS is um, Bright Futures Information System. And Bright Futures is a term that's often used in childcare. So uh, for IT, we tend to refer to it as BFIS, but it is the existing um, data system within the Child Development Division that houses data related to um, childcare financial assistance programs. So it's the the program that pays our child care financial assistance tuition to providers on behalf of eligible families. It also houses the professional development and credentials for our child care uh, professionals, um, as well as a bunch of other information. So a lot of the data you've seen presented today is pulled from that system. Wonderful. Thank you. Back to you, Commissioner. Sure. And then moving on. Um, uh, to uh, the, the next slide, um, you know, there were some questions from the committee, um, you know, when the financial supports, you know, regarding all of these programs we run, um, will the market constrict uh, to below pre-pandemic levels? Um, what we do know is that while we've been able to maintain the current system, um, it goes to our earlier conversations. We have, we have uh, infused over, you know, $40 million into the system. Um, it worked. We've we've seen some restriction, um, but but a, but no, nothing out of line with what we don't experience historically um, in the system, given it's a market-based system. Um, so I don't think we know how the system's going to respond once we get back to normal. I think there's so many unknowns, like how our family is going to continue to work. Um, you know, our 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 business is going to continue to allow staff who have the ability to telework to telework parents who, who then are able to do that, are they gonna to continue to choose to have their children stay at home with them and, and kind of juggle those dual demands of caring for their kids, but also uh, telework, um, which many of them are, are doing now. I think we, we don't know the answer to those questions yet. And I think you know, that's some of the work we're gonna to need to do well, once we start coming towards the end of the pandemic is to start working with our partners and, um, and surveying families and understanding, you know, are, are there gonna be permanent or semi-permanent changes to the system based on changes in behavior in response to the pandemic once we come through the other end of it. Um, you know, we do know, um, you know, that, um, you know, low enrollment really does stress the system. 
um, you know, providers need revenue to stay open, um, you know, and, you know, and some of that's due to families making tough choices of having their kids stay home with them. Uh, we, we hope the system rebounds. We want the system to rebound. The system needs to be healthy, um, you know, to support families in our economy and, 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 you know, really, um, help our children develop, you know, in healthy ways, um, um, you know, but we, but uh, uh, one thing we do know is that uh, the pandemic has only um, made the challenge of recruiting and retaining and, 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 and support that much more difficult during the pandemic. Um, you know, those issues um, certainly existed before the pandemic, uh, but um, they will continue, they, they, they've just grown during the pandemic and um, we expect that those will continue to exist after the pandemic. And I think it, you know, we really need to focus on that as well. Is how do we support, um, you know, our, our providers and their staff, um, you know, and, and, if the, and if we continue to experience low enrollment after the pandemic, you know, I think there needs to be a, a larger conversation about how do we respond to that as a system? What are our priorities? And I, and I don't think we have the answers to those questions yet. I think we just need to wait and collect some data to help inform those conversations that really do need to occur once we get better information and de data or uh, how the system's going to respond once we start coming out of the pandemic. So, um, Commissioner, I, one thing popped into my head as you were talking about the future and um, made me think, um, it, what kind of uh, collaboration do do you have with um, say the uh, ACCD and Department of Labor regarding, um, you know, where the most, what part of the state where the most job losses are or what part of the state where they're, you know, they're gaining jobs in, in order to try to figure out is there some way to, um, you know, try to match demand, um, you know, with where there's job growth or job loss and, you know, how those, those intersect, and then uh, after that, we'll go to represent Rumstead. Yeah, there is work that goes on in collaboration with ACCD, you know, Recovery Task Force that that, that really is looking at at that and kind of getting to the heart of your question, um, Madam Vice Chair. And so, you know, we will continue to work closely with all of our state partners, um, not only on just you know the nuts and bolts of of the child care system, but also those broader. Um, you know, system issues of, of employment and where there's job losses, where new jobs are coming and where do we see the demand. I think, you know, just the data that we, we looked at earlier on the first slides regarding, you know, that we've only overall lost like one, you know, 1% of, of, the, of the system slots in the system over the past year. We do know there are certain areas of the state um, that have been hit really hard and, and the worst hit area was Newport and, and, you know, and they struggle economically already. And mm -hmm. so if you want to grow up, you know, an economy in that area, you're going to need childcare providers. And what can we do to support childcare providers in those areas? You know, Middlebury, you know, has some, a strong employment now, it has the college there, but um, they've lost, uh, you know, taken a hit in some of their childcare. They have the hospital there. They have a lot of other businesses in that area and you know you need a child care system that can meet meet the demands of, of that of that economy of that area and a loss of providers can can impact that and so we we do need to be connected in those areas to making sure we understand the needs and the losses and where we need to devote resources to help build up and support uh, new providers coming online to meet the demand that that's likely there thank you representative Bremstead. thank you um I, I really like these questions. I agree. These are things that have been floating around in my head as well. And um, Representative Wood's question was part of my question. The other part is, this is all really the questions around the market. But I think that the other question is to think about the, the people and what the families are thinking about feeling comfortable having both um, members going back to work based on what they can afford as well. And I, I think that we wanna be looking at both of those issues together. Um, and so it's great to think about working with commerce 
I think also we have um, Building Bright Futures that is um, straddles sort of public, private and convenes groups. And it might be a great, some of these um, questions could possibly be got at a little bit through that process as well. Because I think that the pandemic has changed all of us to some degree. And, um, and I really appreciate all of the information that you've put out here today to have us think about these issues and then watch. I mean, we, have, we still have time that we have to figure out how we're gonna get out of the pandemic, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then, and then look at, at behavior, sort of um, what happens next and so much in front of us. So I, I, I super appreciate this, thank you. Any other thoughts or questions from committee members here? Okay, Commissioner. Sure, so uh, we'll go to the last, uh, I think the committee wanted an update on, you know, we've touched on it a little bit in our conversations, because I think, you know, an IT system is central to any um, childcare system and having a, a state-of-the-art system is, is crucial. And, and, you know, it's fair to say we don't have a state-of-the-art IT system right now. And it really does pose some challenges um, in our work. And, um, but as we indicated, you know, we are um, in the process of, of working on our first module. Um, you know, we've gone out to bid um, and uh, selected a vendor and are now in the process of of, of, of negotiating the contract and bringing that vendor on board to start the work. Um, that first module uh, will include the, the CCFAP eligibility and payment functions of the system, which are, are really challenged right now, just you know, day to day in, in, in our system. And so th th that will be a, a, a significant help for us um, when we hopefully roll that module out um, um, in the fall, the end of September, early October. That's our goal. Um, you know, we had we did have five responses to the RFP of, of uh, companies bidding. We we selected one, um, and you know, and so we're going through that process. I indicated um, our goal is um, is as I stated to to have that module functioning and in and in, in use um, by by uh, the end of September, October first. You know, we do really need to meet that time frame because we will be out of compliance with our system with federal requirements um, on October 1st um, with our old system. It just won't meet, meet those requirements. And so we have to have it live by then. So, you know, it's all hands on deck and doing whatever we need to do to make sure we have the resources to meet that time frame on that first module. You know, and then, uh, you know, and then once you know, we do have that in place, you know, that that module is critical for us to continue and support the governor's five-year plan, you know, that's out there regarding um, the child care system and, and rate design and, and, and rate structure, uh, you know, and Sarah Truckle can speak to that a little bit if the committee would, would it like us to, but, you know, we're encouraged, we're, you know, we're finally moving forward on, on a new IT system, a new BFIS system, um, you know, but this, this is just the first module and there's a long ways to go. And as we you know from other IT projects, they're complex. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, you, you hit roadblocks at times that you need to work through. Things don't always go the way you anticipate. And so, you know, there are lessons learned there uh, for DCF and, and it's IE and E work, um, you know, but, but for us, you know, we're excited that we are working on that first module and that's starting. And so that, that is exciting, and, you know, and we look forward to, you know, sharing our progress on that um, as we continue, as we build out that first module. So um, for folks who, uh, the little bit of alphabet soup here, ADS is the Agency of Digital Services. Yes. Um, just as a reminder or new information for some folks. So I have a, a question, uh, Commissioner. Um, so, we're familiar with things that are sort of being built in modules these days. And so when, when you think about um, this new module, will you essentially be running sort of two systems parallel to each other? Um, and then by the, the, the follow-up to that is by the time we have completed all of the necessary modules, 
will that replace the current VFIS system? So in other words, are, are we really updating that system or are we really creating a, a whole new system module by module? Yeah, we, we're building a new system module by module. And so as, as we stand up a new module, this will take the place of the functionality that exists in the other system. Um, the module approach is not without, um, uh, you know, its concerns. And I think you just identified one is, you know, in, you know, like the, you know, the, what they call the waterfall method or, or the big bang product where you drop a whole new system at once. Um, you know, that's not this approach we're doing a module. So when you are doing a module, you, you know, you're using the functionality of your new system you developed in that new module, but yet you're decommissioning those functions in your old system, but then using your, the remainder of that existing system um, to, to, to for your other functions. And that's not without risk too, because that system you're using is unstable to begin with. And that's why you're trying to build a new system. And so while you're trying to decommission some of those other areas of it, you know, there's risk there as well as destabilizing the other areas you need to continue to use. And so um, it, it's complicated, um, but, but the module does reduce your risk of, of when you do a, a big waterfall or big bang development. Whereas like if you drop it all at once and there's problems, your, your whole system is at, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Do uh, committee members have questions about, about the status or any updates around this new system? Representative Brumstead? Sorry to keep asking questions. I was hoping you were almost at my last question, um, Representative Wood, with your questions. Um, so if you were to uh, um, all of a sudden have enough money to do it all in one, as the, you say, the big bang system. Um, and you've already hired a consultant to work with you on the, or a um, contractor to help you with the first module. Would that contract, I mean, would you, would it, is it an easier, is it, how difficult is it to move into a change if money were to appear? Well, we would have to um, go back out to bid. I mean, the other piece of a modular system is, is that you have flexibility to leverage different vendors based on the, the module and the functionality and different expertise that different vendors might bring to that specific piece of technology you're trying to develop. Um, so we would need to go back out to bid, um, but what, you know, and whether we would, a bid out each module at once as a package or continue then to, to go out module by modular so that we could leverage different vendors based on their expertise. It's kind of the approach we've taken now in the IEME system where, um, and it allows, um, you know, in, in I'm just speaking from experience in the IEME world and having been very involved in my prior role as deputy commissioner in, in that project. Um, what, when you bid, when you, bid out bigger chunks of a, of a project, like a, like all at once or, or multiple facets of it, you tend to get the established big companies uh, that, that uh, operate in that space to be the only bidders you receive, like, um, like the Deloitte's and the CGI's and, and, those, and, um, and those other big companies. Versus if you break it up, you, you open the market up and the technology up to smaller companies that 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 can maybe ha have the the expertise and also the, the the staffing to manage that size of a project versus they wouldn't be able to manage the bigger project because that's just not who they are as a company. And so you know we've experienced some successes in IE and E working with some different companies that we never worked before, like with the uploader, because we broke it up into chunks and we and there were companies that really specialized in that area and were able to to manage that, that project really well and deliver results, um, just given the flexibility of that modular approach and how you bid it out and chunk up the work. Okay, okay. I think I, think I understand the, the pros and cons <laughs> to all yeah. of them. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, no, um, I'm by no means an IT expert, but just I'm just speaking <laughs> from my experience is in working in, in that other realm. I understand. I know I have someone at my house who's constantly scratching his head about the uh, 
the IT. <laughs> <laughs> that might be an understatement, Representative Brunstad. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Commissioner, uh, it looks like that you're at the end of your testimony. I just want to check in with you to see if any other members of your staff have additional um, additional testimony that they were anticipating giving, or I, you're I, just kind of doing it all as one. I, I think we were, you know, we've kind of went through our prepare our presentation. Um, I think our team. I know Sarah Truckle and I both have to jump off for the, um, uh, the our 1015 testimony in House Appropriations. Um, but Miranda and Melissa can stay on if there's further conversation or questions the committee has. Great. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate all of this information and these updates. And thank you again for the outstanding job that you've done um, to date through this pandemic. We, we see the results of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And good luck with appropriations. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Folks, I, I think that um, what we're going to look at here, and hopefully the witnesses will bear with us, but um, trying to make sure that people have a little bit of a break after sitting for over an hour. Um, um, welcome, so. and <clears throat> Representative Wood, thank you very much for um, starting us out. Uh, <clears throat> after our brief cause, this is again House Human Services, um, and... Uh, um, our next witness um, in continuation of How Are the Children um, is Holly Morehouse. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Holly Morehouse. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont After School. We are a statewide nonprofit uh, that specializes in positive youth development. We work with programs uh, serving children and youth uh, from kindergarten all the way through young adulthood um, all across the state. And um, we really focus on the time that children and youth spend outside of the classroom, outside of the school day. If you're new -er to the after school issue, when I use the phrase after school, I'm really talking about any of those hours outside the school day. So it could be before school, it could be school vacation weeks, uh, summer's really important, it could be the weekend. I'm also talking about a wide variety of programs from licensed childcare programs to schools, teen centers, park and recreation departments, uh, community organizations, um, serving that, that full breadth of, of youth. Um, thank you uh, to your committee for the time uh, to speak today. Um, Madam Chair, would it be okay if I share my screen to show my slides or? Okay, thank um, you. Absolutely. Uh... Thank you. Um, can you do that? Or Julie, can you make Holly? Yeah, good. Yeah. Did that work? It absolutely worked for what it's, um, we are seeing your presentation part as well. So we okay. are. Um, great. You know, I might. So Sorry. if you start from current slide or present slide or custom slideshow, you should be able to get that part go away unless you want it. Yeah. Perfect. There we go. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with, you know, one of your questions was how are our youth doing in Vermont? And uh, we have some data from October. Uh, Vermont After School is, uh, has been partnering with researchers from the University of Reykjavik. Uh, it's part of the Planet Youth Project. Um, Iceland has been doing tremendous work around positive youth development and primary prevention for about 20 years. And two years ago, uh, Vermont was the, uh, in Vermont After School, we were the first state to sign on in North America uh, to pilot uh, their primary prevention model here. And we're in year two. And a major uh, portion of the project is to survey our young people in seventh through 12th grade um, every fall and to use that data to uh, work on strategies in the community cross sector to improve the lives of young people. So the data I'm sharing um, this morning uh, is from that survey this, this past October, just a few months ago. It's from five communities. It's not statewide. The pilot's in, in uh, five communities right now. Um, it is all seventh and 12th graders and all the, and the, all the schools in those communities um, were invited to participate in the survey. Uh, you'll see uh, some of the data um, has, you know, can uh, 
uh, give us a great feeling, a good feeling. 91% uh, of our middle school students report that it's easy to receive caring and warmth from parents. 93% uh, of high schoolers uh, say their parents know where they are in the evenings. Um, another high percentage say their parents know the parents of their friend. These are all protective factors around youth resilience. Um, you'll see about three quarters of middle schoolers feel safe in their community. 46%, um, you could look at that glass half full, glass half empty, um, you know, would like to live in the same community in, in the future. So there are some positive indicators, even with COVID. Um, the survey um, looks at multiple dimensions. It looks at school, community, family life, and then peers. And, and, and these are just a, a few of the indicators. Uh, this year in the survey, we also worked with the Iceland researchers to add specific COVID um, and mental health questions. And this is where I think we need to really sit up and pay attention. Um, in the past month, almost a third of youth never felt confident in their ability, never felt confident in their ability to handle personal problems. And 29% felt like things were never going their way. 38% felt like difficulties were piling up so high that they could not overcome them sometime or often. Um, almost half, 45.5% of high schoolers say that COVID has made their mental health worse. Uh, there were some follow-up questions. Um, we see similar levels of increases uh, for their own concern for their own mental health, but they're also concerned about the mental health of those around them. 47% uh, of high schools report that COVID has worsened school connections and 57% of our 11th and 12th graders has hurt their educational experience. Over half say they're more lonely due to COVID um, and about an, um, half as well feel that they're more anxious. Um, these last bullet points also concern me, 41% uh, um, of youth report nervousness in the last week and over a third are um, having sleeping problems. Um, so definitely some concerning numbers. And I think that as we talk about childcare and the needs of working families, and we talk about education and, and learning loss, we really need to be elevating and paying attention uh, to these indicators as well and what supports and programs we have in our, in our state uh, to help address them. The, I also um, uh, submitted a written report and, and these slides really talk to those points, um, but I thought it was easier to speak from slides uh, than from text. Um, but in looking at those numbers and what's been going on in the field, uh, I will say that the after school and I will say after school and youth serving organizations have responded in a number of different ways. Uh, as we heard with the hub testimony, you, you know, they re they've responded around both childcare and learning. So when you look at after school, it fits you know, some of the programs are regulated child care programs. Some of them are not. Some of them are serving children that are too old. Um, they're beyond age 12 or 13. Uh, some are school-based and have exemptions and aren't licensed. Um, but many of them fit into that, that space as well. I would say that every program, high quality program, is looking at both child care and learning. Um, they have stepped forward during COVID to provide child care for essential workers they stepped forward in the summer, even when school buildings were closed to run summer programming because they felt, we all felt, was so important for children to get back where they could um, while our rates were low. Uh, they have worked with schools, especially the ones who ran summer and childcare um, programs, worked with schools to help many schools reopen and figure out the processes that they needed to run. Um, we don't hear about that as much, but it's ha happened across the state. Um, then we heard about the hubs, so they stepped forward in places where schools could not open and provide those services. Um, and even in places where schools did open, many after-school programs ran extended hours. So schools would open till 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. and sort of a reduced schedule, and it was the after-school program that was picking up uh, the slack there and running, you know, from 11 till 4 or 5 or 6 in the evening. Um, the schools also, uh, after school programs did a lot of connecting with families to make sure they had resources around food and mental health, uh, ex offered those extended hours. Uh, many of them uh, uh, switched over and started helping with the school uh, food delivery programs. They were on the buses uh, delivering the meals. Uh, they were sending home enrichment packets with materials and supplies for science or art. Uh, they switched to doing virtual programming. And they offered many spaces and continue to offer spaces for young people to connect, to find agency, 
um, agency is so big right now, right? When you're feeling helpless and you're feeling anxious and you're feeling disconnected and you're feeling lonely, finding areas for our young people to engage in important conversations, to connect with each other, I can't emphasize it enough. Um, a number of programs worked with us over the summer. We had 50 young people come together to work on the idea of a state youth council. Uh, Representative Diane Lamfer is introducing a bill around that. Um, we have another 10 communities are piloting youth councils and participatory budgeting um, to, for youth to find solutions during COVID. And um, they all have $9,000 to spend on stipends and on resources. So a lot of important resor uh, resources and response in the field. What we learned during COVID is this strong network of providers is so important um, in places where there was not an after school program existing or a community partner or youth serving partner to step forward. Uh, it was harder to create a hub when you need a child care hub. It has been harder for schools to restart and meet uh, the needs of families with the modified schedules. Um, it's been harder for families to find um, the resources they need. Uh, school and community partnerships are really important. We've had places where from the beginning, schools and after school programs work closely together around the schedules. Uh, Representative McFawn, you had a question earlier about sort of the underutilization of the system. And, and part of that is, is, I would say, is due to timing and lack of communication. Um, you know, if a school rolls out a school reopening plan or changes a schedule, um, pretty late in the day and the community partners and the after school programs don't have time to adjust, then they can't open the program on time. And, um, and parents need to know ahead of time because they'll, they'll move forward. We saw this some in the fall, they moved forward with other options before the, some of the hubs were open because they had to. Um, so the more as we think forward this winter and spring of how to meet the needs of children and families, uh, the more we can pay attention to timing and communication, um, I think is really important. Um, I think that we also learned some assumptions about um, funding and flexibility and Commissioner Brown spoke to that um, really eloquently um, earlier this morning. Um, I, there's also some assumptions, uh, not every school wants to run after school or wants to run childcare. They don't, <laughs> they didn't with the hubs, they don't always wanna do it. Not every employer, uh, many times they wanted to run a hub, let's say, or, or an after school program, but when we got further into discussion, maybe they had a space, but they didn't actually want to run it themselves, right? They wanted a community partner, the Y, or a, a community organization to come in and run the program. Um, they wanted it to happen, but they didn't want it to run it themselves. We, we had very few, hardly any that, that stepped forward to do that. So, um, but on the other hand, not all of our after school programs are part of the regulated system, you know? So how do we develop solutions um, that really uh, support the, the full field. Um, Cross-agency collaboration was also spoken about. I can't say how highly I have valued and, and treasured the collaboration with DCF and CDD um, through the fall, um, especially around the hubs um, and the work to support uh, the child care field. Um, we work with a number of state agencies and both the collaboration with Vermont After School, but also um, across each other. Um, was really what helped um, make things move. Um, and then I will say for the after school field as, as a whole, I think the child care field is in the 30%, I guess the capacity has been lowered after school, especially with the summer was about 50%. Um, but that's taking into account as well, things like teen centers um, and um, some of the non-regulated programs. Where we're still seeing gaps, um, as I said, there are many after school providers and youth serving organizations that have extended their hours. Um, they, if they didn't have remote learning days, they didn't qualify for hubs, or if it was too late in the fall and a hub couldn't be established or now in January and they're running extended um, times, there, it, there isn't an easy way to pay for that. And often the participation fees, um, I think Representative Brown from said you had a question about that. It really does fall on families. And um, we've seen that over and over again, even um, in some of the hubs where the hub was in a school building where a, a child normally attended school, the parent was now taking them to the school, the same building, right? Sometimes with the same staff and now having to pay for that care. Um, and, and that was, you know, that's often hard to reconcile and, you know, paying for six to 30 hours of care um, that you weren't expecting to, to, uh, to pay for is a heavy burden. Um, so I'm hoping any solutions moving forward uh, can, um, can really focus on um, alleviating uh, those costs and those fees. 
The other thing we learned is, you know, middle school youth also need access, especially on remote learning days. Um, the, the HUB program ended at grade six, and we had a number of parents and families looking for care for seventh and eighth graders. And it's the same with our child care system that ends right around like, uh, 12 years old or 13th birthday. Um, middle school students are prime for risky behaviors, right? Um, and when you look at all the primary prevention, and I know that's something this committee cares about deeply, and there's so much research about how after school helps with primary prevention, um, but they gotta have programs um, and they've gotta have supervised and supportive programs. And um, those are really key years when we, when we don't necessarily want them home alone. Um, uh, the focus on mental health, resilience, youth voice, I think is gonna be important um, in the next year. And, um, and I will say the demand uh, there is a, one of the handouts I gave you is from the After School for All report. It came out in December 2020. Um, it's a national study. It's based on a parent survey and it found that Vermont, uh, there's about 26,000 children and youth who would be in programs today. Uh, it found that the largest barriers were availability. So there's areas of the state where there are no programs, affordability, the fees are, are too high and accessibility. And they talked about transportation. So those were the three main barriers. Um, I will also point out, um, if you look at that handout, it's America After 3-1, that uh, Vermont was ranked um, in the top 10 in the nation for the second time in a row. Um, last time was in 2014 for our after-school programming, uh, but we were ranked 51st in the nation for the percentage of kids who are in after-school programs to qualify for free reduced lunch um, meals. So low-income kids, we have the lowest. The first DC was in the mix. Um, the lowest rate uh, of um, uh, low children in our programs. And that is related to the, the fees and accessibility. Uh, look on recommendation. Please, 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 please. Um, as we have learned during COVID, when you child childcare- Excuse me, so um, Holly, yes. you're having, or at least I'm hearing problems. I'm wondering if you could take your picture yourself off your own video, your your own picture off and just talk for a while. Am I the only one committee who was having a little trouble? No, um, I'm having trouble too. I'm so, sorry. No, no, no. What if so, I, stop sharing? Um, I think it's, well, it's either, I've, usually when this happens, we suggest that people go voice only. And I think, but I'm now looking at other people who know things more than I do. Yeah, just stop your video, Holly. Okay, it, is it that better? Help. Yeah. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, um, I hold guess, on, can, can she share her um, screen or she has to do it all video? Holly should be able to share her screen as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It takes a village. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate the support. Um, <laughs> um, so recommendations, um, once again, just this committee for thinking about that full range of care throughout COVID, um, uh, you know, especially uh, for elementary school, um, but also I would say and up through grade eight at least, um, and continue to parity for the after school field alongside the early childhood and child care field, um, both in and in vaccination. Um, and I would say that for you know, school day teachers. Um, I'm also hoping that as these plans in uh, schools around uh, remediation and enrichment opportunity, um, that uh, they continue, uh, that they include after school early um, and often those plans. Um, that as we look at the cost of running programs for childcare and learning outside the school day that we will see in recovery dollars. Um, so full burden to all the parents and families over the next year. Um, I'm really hoping and imagining, envisioning this year really being about that youth resilience piece and addressing those concerns, that data that we looked at up top, up front about stress, anxiety, loneliness, mental health. Um, and that when we build our plans for recovery that we don't only talk about less, it's really important, but we also talk about community connection. 
uh, I would love for Planner to start now <laughs> um, and to include Apple and child in those conversations with schools. I think summer's going to be really important. Um, I would love to increase support now families and, and children throughout the winter and spring and then the fall. Um, I will stop there, share, and um, happy to uh, take any questions. Um, and just to say some of the other handouts I gave you, I gave you a fuller packet with data from the Vermont Youth Project. Um, I also shared a, a handout that has some uh, resources on the connection between after and resilience, um, especially for those of you who are new to committee. Um, after school, uh, there's so much data in Vermont around um, participate in after school programs having lower risk uh, behaviors. Um, and so it's really of a, a key, you know, primary prevention strategy in our state. And that handout just points to some of that, those numbers. Today. Holly, Holly, thank you very much. I wanna see if um, what the questions are because you have presented us with some very, um, interesting and thought-provoking information, especially as it relates to um, the middle school kids or whatever. Um, I used to say that there's about a two year period of time max where parents don't have to worry about risky behaviors. And that just when they don't need childcare, you, they really can't be left alone for a while. Um, uh, Representative Redmond, I believe you have your hand up. And you are muted. Yes. No, I, I don't have my hand up, Madam Chair. A oh, representative yeah. Wood and Small. Oh, you have, oh, that's because um, it was my <clears throat> cursor was on your, I apologize. Okay, Representative Wood and then Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Holly, um, I wrote down something and I'm, I think, I, I don't know if I misheard it or I misunderstood it. Um, uh, did you say that there was a reduction in capacity of after school programs of 50%? I did say that. Um, that was from surveys that we did over the summer. Um, there were, uh, and it also included, so not just the, the regulated child care, so the school run and the community based on the teen centers, um, a number of programs were not able to run, um, ran into difficulty summer as well. Um, access to space, especially if this wouldn't allow to use that space. And um, am I stuck? Are you able to hear me again? Am I? Uh, it is sort of stuttering a bit. Oh, speaks slowly. <laughs> I don't know what helps. What else would help on that? I'm so sorry. Um, all right. Um, here. Um, so has so that yes, come up? Has, has that come up at all now that schools are at least partially in session? You know, the use of their facilities and things. Some better. Um, some. Um, there are some that felt. Um, that they uh, never wanted to offer services during COVID. Uh, they felt that families were stressed enough. So even with virtual learning, allow their programs to run. Uh, it's, it was kind of a district district uh, decision um, on that. And then often the program for the older youth, some of the teen centers and so forth, and the health data is different for the older youth. So that also does influence um, some of those decisions. Um, okay. Um, and then I just had a quick question. I, I took a quick look at the Vermont Youth Project um, data summary that you provided. And I, I'm just curious if that is coordinated with the um, youth behavior, youth risk behavior survey that the Department of Health, I think, believe does. It's, it seems like um, so a lot of similar information. And I'm just wondering if that's the same survey or a different survey or if it's coordinated in some way? Um, if it is a different survey, it is um, 
is in partnership, though. We work uh, closely with the Department of Health on that project, the Vermont Youth Project. Uh, the focus of the Vermont Youth Project survey is a little bit different. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a national surveillance tool. So it's about checking at a point in time, and it takes about a year and a half or two before we get that data back. The deal with the um, Vermont Youth Project Bay and the work plan that you that it's a real time and it's meant to be a strategy identifying survey. So do the survey in October, we get data back within weeks, and then there's a whole series of work that we do um, with the community to use that data to improve strategies in those different domains, um, school, family, um, peer groups, and um, out of school. Thank they you. have slightly different focus. Um, there is, they do um, things that align, there are questions that align, um, but I will say the, the Planet Youth Survey um, really tries to get it not just smoking, but why, <laughs> you know, are you trying e-cigarettes or where are you accessing alcohol? So it gets more like, what would drive some of those strategies? So it's not just what are the behaviors, what are the risk and protective factors leading those behaviors? Are you good, Representative Wood? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Holly, for your presentation. Um, and looking at the data here, I'm not seeing pieces in relation to racial equity. So wondering if there are disparities within our communities of who is able to access these services in regards to identity. And the second piece kind of coming from the Winooski perspective here is knowing our new American families are hesitant around engaging in child care services because of the cultural competency as well as language barriers that exist. And wondering if there are any considerations uh, moving into the new year that we should be aware of. That is a great and I'm really glad I asked it, thank you. Um, so, so I don't have data from that survey, but we do have research um, analyst staff and uh, we've been looking at the equity and inclusion data for the after school field for a few years now. I will say that the, the main group uh, that rises to top concern is LGBTQI. Um, they're really uh, significantly underrepresented in uh, after school programs and the participate. Um, also, do you see some racial disparities, um, certain areas? as far as the English language learners and new Americans, times the participation um, is actually higher uh, when programs really reached out um, and are providing supports uh, for those student populations. Um, we'll also say that there is a new inclusion tool that we, we are working with on the NEXT Foundation um, and that programs across the state highlighting this year really look at you know, the structure of their program, their outreach, their communication, um, how they reach to youth, how they interact with families, um, they can do around staffing, and so really um, emphasize inclusion. We've also been running a diversity inclusion series of, of community practice year long for the entire field. So we're hoping to um, really raise aware, um, and, and I do appreciate your, comment, your question. Thank you, Holly. And now building on the information that you shared in relation to LGBTQ youth, um, uh, do you understand why the disparities exist with childcare providers and access? I'm not sure I have an answer to that yet. Um, have been working um, with some of our youth and our youth councils um, around this issue. Uh, really highly respect um, the work that Outright Vermont is doing um, with young people and their youth council. Um, and um, I would say now we're really trying to elevate the issue and try to understand it. I'm not sure we have all the answers yet. Um, uh, Representative Whitman has a question and then um, Representative Brumstead has a question as well. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Holly. Um, 
I just wanted a quick clarification. I heard you mention a statistic that we are 51st in the nation as far as providing, um, I don't even want to attempt to, I, it had something to do with uh, food assistance programs and, and participation in after school. Could you just clarify that or tell me where I can, uh, if that was included in your documents or anything like that? Yes. One of the handouts, um, thank you for the question, is from the America After Three report, and that's the report that um, says ninth, ninth in the nation for after school programming. Our high ranking is based on parent, parent satisfaction and the quality of our programs. But we came in 51st um, for a percentage of children who are in after school programs who qualify as low income. So that's the way, right? It's not the of low income in the state who are in after. So when you look at the number of kids in a program across the state, what percentage qualify? And um, nationally, I believe uh, that percentage is around like 45 or something. And, and we're at 15. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Brumstead and um, then Representative McFarn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was gonna leave mine in the chat, I'm sorry. I just, just a quick and a quick question. And also wanna mention that Amy Schollenberger just put in the link to that report that we asked for, so that's great too. Um, thank you, Amy. Um, Holly, I just wondered if the, um, the survey information that you have been talking about, if teachers, especially middle school teachers, are able to um, see that information and process it a little because they're working with all these kids too. Yes, thank you. So last week, actually, we brought the five communities together with the lead researcher, Alfred Christian uh, from Iceland um, to dig into the data with their strategic planning team. So each community gets their community level data there's a whole separate set of groups that are the school, and those go to the superintendents. Um, that's who we send to, and um, hopefully they share with the principals. Um, one of the things that we try to be careful with, with the data is that we don't end up with one community uh, comparing those to another community and sort of like, well, we're Ben so and so, or, you know, or the other thing we don't want to run into is. Um, so much having the community just look at school, you know, the school is the problem and the school is going to be the one to find all the solutions. Part of the Vermont Youth Project model is that it is not all about the school. It's about the community, about the family, it's about the out of school time, right? And so part of how we actually got communities to sign on to pilot the model is by explaining to schools that it wasn't going to all be on them. We have to survey through the school because they have the youth um, and, the, you know, really young people. Uh, but we don't want them to be the ones that are responsible for all, all the strategies or answers. So data goes to them and then they can share it um, if they want to. And the community-wide data where schools are all mixed and averaged out in the community's hands. Um, and they're going through a process now of rolling out and sharing um, across their communities. Thank you, Holly. As a past school board member, I love that you're looking at all the broad perspective on this and um, all the things at play. That is just terrific. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn, was I calling on you and you didn't have a question or you do have one? Um, no, I, I had a question and it was answered. Oh, thank okay. You. Great. Um, Holly, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and committee, there are lots of reports um, and more information that she has um, given us. And I think that um, it will be interesting for us to look at who are the five communities, um, et cetera, in terms of where the uh, data has been brought from. Um, I do want to um, comment that it is 11 o'clock. And um, if we want to give anyone time for lunch, we would be leaving at 11.45. Um, and so our next, I um, wanna welcome um, Sherry Carlson, who is the Chief Programs Officer of Let's Grow Kids and Sarah Kenny, who is the Chief Policy Officer of Let's Grow Kids. And um, 
Let's Grow Kids have um, testified a lot, um, a lot in front of this committee. They also testified um, or presented all sorts of data and their report to the Women's Caucus. And so I would ask that they not do the same thing here today. Um, you have both of you here. I'm not sure who is speaking. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're gonna um, do a little baton pass here. Um, thanks for inviting us to be here today. We recognize that there are still lots of witnesses to get through, so um, we'll condense. Um, we, I just wanna start by saying that um, Sherry is the parent of two young adults and I have a middle schooler and I just wanna reinforce the data that Holly just shared, which really reflects a lot of what we're seeing from our kids' contemporaries. Um, so we're really, we really value our relationship with the Vermont After School and our partnership and um, the work that they're doing is so important. So important to think about our kids across the age spectrum. So we've been really happy to partner with them uh, in, in a couple different ways through the course of this pandemic. Um, and we just wanted to share with the committee today some of the insights that um, we've been able to glean through all of this work over the past 10 months and then a little bit of what we're seeing in terms of opportunities moving forward. And Sherry's gonna kick us off. Thanks, Sarah. Again, for the record, my name is Sherry Carlson. I'm the Chief Programs Officer for Let's Grow Kids. And as most of you know, Let's Grow Kids is a nonprofit organization on a mission and we're working to ensure affordable access to high quality childcare for all Vermonters by 2025. So over the past seven years, we've grown into a small team um, with this mission in mind and um, into a movement with over 30,000 supporters from all walks of life. This includes families, early childhood educators, business leaders, health professionals, and Vermont community members who realize the essential role that childcare plays in the lives of Vermont children and families for our communities and our businesses and for our economy. So um, be even before the pandemic, Vermont, as we've talked about before, had faced a childcare crisis. Three out of five of Vermont's youngest children didn't have access to childcare they needed. And uh, research had estimated that Vermont would need an additional 2,000 early childhood educators to meet the demand. And as we've talked about um, before, COVID-19 has exacerbated these challenges. So in order to address um, the challenges uh, pre-pandemic and uh, even more intensely post-pandemic, a very, um, or not post, we're not post yet, God, soon, um, a very big part of Let's Grow Kids work is our direct support of childcare programs. So over the years, we have been mentoring and supporting the state's early childhood educator and childcare programs and helping them to strengthen their programs, to expand, um, existing programs and also to create new ones. And we've been um, able to dramatically increase that work thanks to investments that the administration and legislature have made over the past two years in expanding a child care capacity. So just to give you a little, some numbers, um, over the past three years, we've been able to pair state investments with philanthrop um, phil philanthropic dollars and invest almost $4 million in additional high quality child care spaces in Vermont. So these spaces and investments have really helped to counteract the widespread closures um, that other states have seen because of the pandemic. And we're on track to uh, reach a total of over 2000 additional high quality spaces located throughout the state by June, um, 2021. And we have even more projects and spaces in the pipeline. Another big part of our work is being a resource for childcare programs. We have a team of experienced early educators who provide technical assistance to programs with technology, business solutions, shared services, their program practices, and uh, working um, to advance the early childhood workforce to be recognized as a profession. Over the past year, we've provided some st specific TA to help um, childcare programs uh, reopen, stay open, respond to the operational challenges of doing business during a pandemic. And I just will, you know, it's been said before, but we've um, had a firsthand look at the many incredible ways that early childhood education programs have adapted and innovated since the early days of the pandemic. And I don't want us to forget that 30%, about 30% of the regulated childcare programs have stayed open throughout the pandemic. And we're providing care to um, children of essential workers last spring. 
As programs began to reopen, um, some shifted to outdoor cl classrooms or others invested in major structural changes to keep children and staff safe and adhere to the state's health and safety guidelines. Early childhood educators got really creative in helping children adapt to the new world where faces are covered, where sharing is no longer encouraged, where parents aren't allowed in the building at pickup or drop off. Um, their amazing adaptability and creativity and resilience um, has truly shown over the past year. And they do all of this, as we know, for little pay, no health care benefits, um, and often um, no other benefits. Now, the pandemic has added uh, to the existing challenges and created new ones. It has also highlighted some of the deep inequities in our child care system. Families have had enormous child care struggles over the past year on many levels. Um, here again, some of the important investments that the legislature and administration have made both before and during the pandemic have softened the blow for many Vermonters. The investments the legislature and administration made in child care financial assistance in 2019 meant that low income families uh, were better able to afford care. And uh, yet uh, we know and knew we have so much more work to do. Um, while some of the closure information shared by Commissioner Brown, uh, Brown can seem daunting, Vermont's child care system has fared better than most all other child care systems in the country. And that's thanks to the remarkable investments made by the legislature and administration since COVID-19 hit. So on behalf of Let's Grow Kids, I want to thank you for your hard work and dedication to supporting Vermont's child care system during this unprecedented time. Um, our work in Vermont, your work, continues to set a standard for the nation and how to sustain this essential industry. And because of swift, thoughtful, and consistent action, Vermont's fragile but essential child care education system, early education system, avoided um, what could have been utter disaster. And programs and families and early childhood educators did receive some um, crucial supports. So as we heard earlier, Child Development Division is working hard on plans to design a program for the new federal COVID-19 response funds um, that we expect to come to Vermont, totaling what we hear is about 12.5 million. These funds will help, um, but they won't solve our bigger structural problems which existed prior to the pandemic. And I'm turning it over to Sarah to touch on a few of those. We're not going to spend a lot of time today talking about those bigger structural issues that we need to solve together because I'm hoping we'll have more opportunities to do that in the coming days. Um, but Commissioner Brown specifically highlighted a, a number of initiatives in his testimony earlier. Um, and it's always so nice to be able to come to the committee and say, we really agree <laughs> with the Child Development Division um, in reflecting on some of those challenges, uh, challenges and some of the opportunities we have moving forward. Um, and Representative Brumstead earlier highlighted this key question about affordability for families. Um, and we did, the investments that you made have meant that there's more support for families who are enrolled in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, that eligibility was expanded slightly, and that has really helped families, especially as programs were closing and reopening, and families have been having to make really hard decisions about whether they're going to send kids back for how long, um, if they even have a choice in that. Um, and so we can look forward to continuing to work with you all on that five-year redesign plan. In the meantime, during the, um, the early days of the closure period during the pandemic, the state made an important change, which was shifting to paying programs based on the number of children who were enrolled in the child care program, as opposed to who was attending in any given week. Um, and that is national best practice in general. And it meant that families didn't have to worry about paying unexpectedly when CCFAP wouldn't cover it if their kids weren't in, actually in the program. It provided a consistent source of funding for programs through that period. Um, and the state switched back to paying based on attendance um, once the programs were allowed, were, were all encouraged to reopen. Um, and that's a switch that we would recommend switching back to, especially during these coming months of continued pandemic response, but, but moving forward, um, it's really best practice. And, um, it makes a huge difference for families and for programs. Then um, when we think about access and quality for programs, as Sherry said, um, we've been working in close partnership with CDD thanks to the support that you all authorized to, to build the capacity of programs. 
Um, and it's really critical. And I think you all have had some really good conversation already this morning about, we don't really know what's coming in terms of how much capacity will be needed, but everybody we talk to is really desperately waiting to be able to get back into their childcare program. So we are not anticipating that there will be a huge drop off in demand post pandemic for childcare capacity. Um, and now is really the time to continue investing in that capacity in, in large part because a lot of those investments result in stable programs um, and reduces the level of turnover we see in programs where some are closing, new ones are opening, um, higher quality programs are stronger and better able to weather storms and, and pandemics like this one. Um, so now the time to continue those, those infrastructure investments. Um, we also agree with Commissioner Brown that the relief grant program, the operational relief grant program was a really helpful resource for programs once you all helped to smooth out some of the wrinkles in the application process for that program. Um, thank you for that too. We are looking forward to working with the administration to, um, to support them in thinking what, that, what this next round of funding can support. Um, I was pleased to hear some of the ideas that Commissioner Brown floated this morning for that. Um, we did hear during the operational relief grant program cycle this past fall that the applications were really difficult for a lot of programs. Um, and so we'll recommend that, um, that the department look at, so the division look at some of the more streamlined applications that they use for other, other relief programs that they operated during COVID. Um, I think there's a way to do the level of data tracking that the commissioner is talking about, which is important and also make it easy for programs that are just juggling so much and are so far underwater right now and trying to manage everything and lower tuition, lower income because fewer children are attending. Um, we wanna make it as easy as possible for folks to access those programs. Um, I was also really pleased to hear Commissioner Brown reference um, the, the challenges that programs are facing in recruiting and retaining staff and the, just the incredible level of commitment that Sherry highlighted that we've seen from early childhood educators over the past year. Um, the best indicator of quality in a program is the expertise and the professional preparation of the early childhood educators who are in that program. And we knew we had a workforce shortage even before the pandemic and that has only been widely, wildly exacerbated um, by our current situation. So um, we really need to support people who are currently in the field um, and support access to care into the future by continuing to shore up the workforce in early childhood education programs. Um, and there are lots of investments that we can be making there with these new federal funds and with other investments to support access to professional preparation to um, workforce stabilization and other wage support programs um, and to professional learning opportunities for folks. I think early childhood educators have literally been on the front lines of responding to children's and families' needs. And I'm, I'm glad you're gonna hear from one of the parent child centers because they've been really involved in that as well. Um, and having a skilled workforce that's well-versed in the impact of trauma and creating equitable classrooms has never been more important than it is right now. And so providing those professional pathways for folks to develop those skills is critically important. Um, and then it wouldn't be there at, at talking to the Human Services Committee if I didn't circle back to the issue of IT, which you all have talked about at length this morning and is so important. Um, and you know, we have seen, yes, we knew before the pandemic that the IT system at CDD was fragile. And it has really compounded the difficulties in, in being able to manage supporting programs through the pandemic. So it has definitely impacted pandemic response, I would say. Um, so we know that, that you all have discussed with Commissioner Brown already, the fact that the, the underspend in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program for this current fiscal year is almost exactly the amount needed for the IT system. We still are hopeful that there might be a way to um, move those funds forward into the coming fiscal year to continue that build out of the modules that Commissioner Brown was describing this morning. And even if it's even if that's not possible, um, there are definitely other ways that the, the child care system needs support right now and that those child care dollars should be directed to continue to support child care purposes as opposed to dropping the, the bottom line in the general fund. So thank you all so much. We know that our recovery from COVID really depends on us getting childcare right. And we're so happy to be working with you all on this. We're happy to take questions and, and also looking forward to um, hearing from Building Bright Futures who has a, 
a lot more data to share from folks around the state right now. Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm gonna go back to a question that I asked earlier. Um, uh, you made this statement that people are waiting to get um, their children back into uh, the childcare programs. Uh, did I hear that right? Yeah, what I meant by that was I think they're waiting for it to feel safe for them to send kids back or for them to be able to go back to their workplaces and yeah. then needing childcare or for their kids to be back in school full time so that they can actually go back to full time work. I was just at the, the Commission on Women did a, a, an event last week and shared some new unemployment data that indicated that 74% of the unemployment claims are women in Vermont. And that doesn't include all the people who just temporarily or permanently stopped looking for work because they have to be home with their kids right now. And a lot of those are people, at least in my universe, and a lot of folks I talk to are people with school age kids who need to be home anyway, and so are also keeping their younger children now. Yeah, that, that, that's happening yeah. with, with one of my daughters at this yeah. point. Um, my question is this, at this point in time, um, do you feel that we are going to have the capacity uh, to meet that need going forward with the problems of recruiting staff and the problems of uh, mm -hmm. Sent, uh, facilities not reopening? No. I mean, we didn't have the capacity before the pandemic, Representative I know that. and it's only that's, that's what now, I mean. So you have, you, yeah. You've tuned into one of the things that keeps Sherry and me awake at night. <laughs> Sherry, I don't know if you want to say more about that. No, okay, I do. So, so we know that. All, all right. We're, we're all in agreement. So what can we do about that? We've got a ton of money and how can we use that money to build that capacity? That's, have, that's what I'm looking for. We have a lot of ideas, Representative McFawn, and I'm, she can't tell, but I'm looking at your chair because I know we're gonna be talking about this specific question more in the coming days. So we can talk about it a little bit now, or we can- No, that, wait. I can Madam wait. Chair, I, I can it. wait as long as we're all gonna get on that page sometimes, mm -hmm. because it's, it's nice to talk about everything that we've done and, and all of it is great. And it's nice Agreed. to talk about the support that we did during the pandemic. What we have to realize is the, the situation that we're in today as we're sitting here is worse than it was back in March in terms mm -hmm. of the pandemic. So uh, I know that's gonna get better with the vaccinations. And as this uh, need comes up, we need to be ready. We need to have the capacity to deal with it. So that's what I want to talk about when we get to it. Not today, because we don't have time to really do it right. Thank you. Representative Pugh, you're muted, sorry. Thank you, thank you Representative McFawn. Um, uh, Sarah, I have a question for you. We're looking at the budget adjustment and that's, um, as I've said before, that's rearranging the deck chairs. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of money right now that in the um, proposed budget um, related to childcare, it's gonna go to the bottom line. So if you had to make a choice between putting it towards IT or to um, uh, switching to the, um, switching the way of reimburse of, of, of delivering um, CFAP, which is your prep, which do you think would make the most difference in um, to families? And what a great question, Representative Pugh. Um, I actually am glad that Melissa Regal Garrett is still on the line because I don't know what the overall cost would be or how far $4.8 million would get us in switching back to an enrollment-based system for childcare financial assistance. And I don't know if I don't know if CDD knows that number off the top of their heads either, but I think it would be really great to look at. Um, um, I'm not talking money. I'm talking what is the better 
Um, what, what is the better policy response? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm an advocate, so I would always, of course, say both. And I think the IT system really underpins our ability to do all of the other structural changes that we're looking at moving forward. And I'm also sensitive to the child development divisions. I don't know what the limitations are. I, I really appreciated Representative Brumstead earlier asking Commissioner Brown the question about, but if you had all the money right <laughs> now, could you do all the modules at once? And I'm not, I, I couldn't completely tell if that would even be a possibility. And I see Melissa off video, so I don't know if you would like her to chime in on that. Um, the answer, the question I asked you was make a choice. Yes. The answer that you gave was IT. I think with one-time dollars, that would I'm be just, a logical, yes. Melissa, hi. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. It's great to be back. Um, people sort of were talking about you as if you had information for us or additional information um, around cost or things like that. And so I thought I would offer you the opportunity to say you can respond or to say that you'll get back to us. Yeah, we would uh, welcome the opportunity to get back to you uh, if you wanted to um, have your assistant send us specific questions. Um, we would be happy to follow up. Uh, I can tell you that um, the question of enrollment versus attendance is definitely a much deeper dive question around policy um, than uh, just a straightforward answer. Uh, and there are many ways that our system, different from many other state systems, has levers that we are already utilizing that make it pretty much an attendance-based enrollment system. Um, so, uh, and I would also uh, stress that uh, as Commissioner Brown testified to, um, our staff are uh, doing uh, hand uh, manipulations of our system in order to make payroll on a regular basis. Um, and any changes in this moment uh, including uh, trying to go to enrollment, that, that's actually a hand-run uh, system for us. That's how we had to do it last time uh, during the closure period. And so uh, without a change in IT, uh, the capacity to actually implement that change um, uh, would be uh, difficult for us. Um, so, but I'd be happy to get you. And you've just gone mute. Be happy to get you okay. um, more information if you have further questions on uh, policy change itself or um, funding. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, committee, um, committee, I need your help. Um, it is 1130. We have 15 more minutes and we have three people that we have not heard from and I don't want to give them, and I so apologize for having too big an appetite and trying to fit too much in. Um, we um, there is a part of me that would um, give um, Margot Holmes the opportunity to um, speak uh, partially because I think Morgan has more to say than in 15 minutes. Um, and um, uh, Morgan from the Building Bright Futures um, and uh, Amy from Voices for Vermont's Children um, said she has bad internet. <laughs> um, so that's sort of where I am going and I so apologize, um, but I will take input from one, the people who um, have been waiting all day and listening, um, and two, from you all in terms of what you think makes most sense or whether to give everyone five minutes. Madam Chair, it, it seems as though your direction sounds, sounds good. Uh, Margo has a uh, parent child center to get back to running, so um, that would seem to make sense. And I think we could probably have the other folks back. 
ne next week. And um, uh, uh, Amy has, um, uh, Voices for Vermont's Children has offered to submit testimony in writing um, for the interim, and that would be great. Um, and, um, Madam Chair, oh, my vote is for Margo to go. Okay. Um, and um, uh, uh, Morgan is, is graciously saying that she would welcome the opportunity at another time. Um, um, I really thank the two of you. And Margo, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to come speak with you all today. I promise only to take a couple minutes of yeah. your time. Take as uh, much time as you need. You've been waiting all day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Margo Holmes, and I am the Executive Director at the Springfield Area Parent Child Center in North Springfield, Vermont. Uh, so first and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for your support and efforts on behalf of children and families and the child care providers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it has made a, a huge difference uh, in, in our functioning during this time. Uh, I also just briefly wanted to speak to the budget question that just arose um, with uh, Let's Grow Kids. And while I agree that both uh, would absolutely be best, uh, I also believe that the most uh, impactful thing that we can do is what is going to make the biggest difference uh, in the lives of children and families. And while uh, an IT system would certainly make things easier for providers to provide care, I, I believe that families would be impacted most uh, by a change in the way that CCFAP is administered to ensure consistency of care. Uh, so during this difficult time, we have seen amazing strengths and incredible challenges. Uh, I do have a handout uh, that I hope that you all have that goes into more detail, and I'm just going to highlight a few of those today. Uh, we see that children are struggling with inconsistent schedules due to shutdowns and quarantine requirements. They are dealing with inconsistent caregivers, as teachers often have to be out for the same reasons. And they are dealing with learning a whole new way of interacting with those around them because of facial coverings and simple things such as not being able to sing indoors or play a game of tag. These things can create increases in challenging behaviors for young children. With this, we are also seeing the incredible resilience of children. But children need resilient caregivers in order to support this social emotional minefield. Parents and child care staff alike are stressed, exhausted, and lonely. Child care staff have done amazing things to adapt to this by offering virtual preschool programs, Zoom circle times, take home activities, and growing in their own professional development to respond to emerging challenges. They continue to do all of this with no increase in resources. Wages are neither competitive nor sufficient. Families are responding to this time by adapting to new technology, learning the new ways of interacting with staff, and growing in their own knowledge of child development. They are doing all of this while struggling with unemployment or reduced work hours, high childcare bills and other expenses, and parenting children who continue to have their own struggles. Uh, I would like to share two stories with you. In Springfield, we have a four-year-old little boy who was just diagnosed with a very rare form of bone cancer. Staff who have cared for this little boy for years cannot even give him, his mother a hug. We are doing our best to support them in many other ways. We are cooking for them daily and delivering meals to their home. We are creating Zoom opportunities for him to spend time with his friends and teachers. We have forgiven a childcare bill and held their slot indefinitely. And we are joining community-wide fundraising efforts to support them to pay their medical bills. This is what childcare programs do. We care for children and their families. Also in our childcare program, we have an associate teacher who is a single mother of four young children in various school programs. While she is doing everything she can to be at work consistently, she's continuously had to keep her children home due to state required quarantines. She and her children have been tested repeatedly in the last several months, causing anxiety and difficulties in waiting for the results, sometimes for a whole week. She has exhausted her paid time off. She has exhausted her support system to help her care for her kids so she can come to work 
or to pick up groceries for her and her children during quarantine times. She's struggling to make ends meet. As a conscientious employer, we continue to support her in every way possible, but it also creates challenges for our program. We cannot increase the number of slots available in our classrooms because we know we will have this and other staff out for these reasons continuously. This creates enormous reductions in income at a time when expenses are at an all time high. We continue to pay additional staff or outside cleaning agencies for extensive cleaning and disinfecting services. And we have upgraded HVAC systems and physical space to adhere to safety guidelines. We appreciate the COVID relief funding that has been granted to support these efforts, but it goes beyond just this pandemic. This was a struggling system before the pandemic and it will continue to struggle after unless we take this moment to make the critical changes that are needed. We need a system that meets families and programs where they are and creates a sustainable multi-generational system of care that focuses on strengthening families so children can thrive. We want to hold on to this opportunity to embrace what has worked during this time and move toward greater equity and build on what we have learned during this challenge. We want to ensure that the open conversations between the state and our Parent Child Center network will remain a regular feature going forward. As the state of Vermont thinks about recovery plans and implementation, we want to be at the table to ensure that the families that we serve are considered and centered in the planning. We must acknowledge that childcare is an essential service, essential to children, to families, to employers, and to communities. And we must act accordingly as we design our state's future. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and I'm happy to take any questions. Margo, thank you. Um, questions for Margo. Representative McFawn, I can't tell if you're looking to ask a question. If you would like me to, I will ask one. Um, I, I, I do have one. I, yeah. I really do have one. I was trying to decide whether I should ask it or not. Um, I, I, I don't know whether this is true or not. Um, was one of the executive orders yesterday that was signed to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Oh, you mean, I don't the, answer. Um, you mean um, the executive orders that our new president signed? Yes. Um, if, uh, if it happened, if it happened, what does that do to the, <clears throat> the, the wages are not competitive and they're not <laughs> adequate? Um, we are certainly in support of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour and supporting uh, staff who are paid some of the lowest wages um, to be brought up um, with, with that ship uh, as, as minimum wages are raised. The concern that it does uh, pose is uh, on the other end of that, how it impacts our bottom lines and how we are able to pay for increasing that minimum wage. If we have to increase childcare expenses um, and tuition in order to pay for that minimum wage, uh, that will oftentimes be deferred to, to parents to have to pay either a copay, even if they're at 100% uh, financial assistance um, or for private pay tuition uh, that will increase for families. And that creates an enormous burden um, for families who are already dealing with very high childcare bills. Um, Margo, um, ballpark, what is the average salary in your, in your parent-child center? At my parent-child center, about two years ago, we raised our minimum wage to uh, $13.50 an hour. Um, we had been down at $11.50 an hour um, as our minimum wage. We raised it up to $13.50. And on average, our child care staff are paid a, approximately $14 to $14.25 an hour. Thank you. Representative Brumstead. Sorry, I did, my answer was around, or my question was right around those two issues that just came up. And I guess since I'm unmuted, 
all I can say is, wow, and I'm so sorry about those two fam. I mean, I know there are millions of or hundreds of families with those kind of stories, but thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Margo, and you, you as, as well as um, Let's Grow Kids, <clears throat> as well on some level as um, Holly, um, highlighted the fact that um, we're sort of balancing or juggling a system that before the pandemic was fragile. And um, with the pandemic, that sort of highlighted that. Um, and uh, Part of our challenge is the pandemic has A, showed us that we can't keep doing things the same way we did them before, because before wasn't good. It was maybe okay, but it wasn't good. So that may mean policy changes. And so we are looking for policy changes and ideas about how to do things differently. Um, Let's Grow Kids has been focused on maintaining the system. So what is it that we need to do differently to maintain the system? And Margo, you began your comments with, I'm concerned about ensuring that, you know, to, uh, you know that you were talking about the families. Well, so what needs to be different in order to ensure that families have access to affordable, accessible childcare? Um, and after school care. And um, so I guess, you know, my, my, um, my plea to all of you who are um, listening is um, what do we need to do differently? Um, <clears throat> there, so were, there were a lot of strings attached well, there were some strings attached to the federal money that we got related to COVID. And um, part of those strings were defining very specifically that the money was to be spent on the um, particular idiosyncratic issues that the pandemic um, um, highlighted not to address underlying or ongoing expenses. Um, if that is still, if that's still going to remain or something similar to that, we're not gonna be able to fix the underlying issues necessarily of the system with the COVID dollars. So some of what we'll need to be figuring out is where are we going to, what is it that we can do to, um, to both address the pandemic, the, the particular um, issues that the pandemic has, has provided. And what can we learn as both of, as all of you who've testified today, what, what worked in terms of how we are doing and what should we continue to do um, with that? And that's gonna be a lot of what that's going to be some of it's not some, one of the multitude of one of the issues that we will be trying to to deal with and thinking about. And um, what I didn't really hear any of you talk about was nighttime childcare, weekend childcare, and um, or um, uh, things like that. And um, Margot is, is texting, texting um, on the chat and, um, and, and directing us all to her handout, which is on our webpage um, with all of the ideas in terms of that. So um, this, is, this is the taste test menu and we'll probably be inviting, we'll be inviting you all back this um, at various pieces, um, but I really thank you um, thank all of you for being part of this morning's um, discussion sort of on how are the children and where are we going to go, as a, especially as it relates um, to childcare. 
and we have um, some very important you know, feedback um, and, and input from um, Building Bright Futures and from Voices to sort of continue that um, discussion. Uh, so um, if there's no other uh, comment from the committee or from any of you who came to testify and have stayed with us for, um, for the morning, With that, um, uh, this ends uh, the morning um, committee meeting for House Human Services on uh, January 21st, uh, 2021.